All right, so I made this presentation for uh, my friends who are not in the message. They have never heard of Serpent Seed or anything like this. So um, it's kind of, uh, I, I, I tried to balance it between like basic enough that people could understand it, but also like in depth enough that people got like the full picture. So it took about a week to make. I actually made it while I was at work at Northwest Fence because I sat at a desk. And so I had my AirPods in listening to messages and like stuff. And if the phone rang, I just pull them out and pick up the phone. But it um, took about a week and I listened to series and uh, messages and read scripture and got a lot of information and tried to organize it in a way that made sense. Because I found that a lot of the stuff that I was seeing had really good information, but it was laid out in kind of a confusing way and uh, it was hard to follow. So I tried to keep that in mind for people who have no idea what I'm talking about. So it's pretty straightforward, simple. So we're gonna start out with a little exercise. Um, I think I asked before, but how many have already seen this? Okay, so most of you. So it's... <laughs> Yeah. So for the people who haven't seen it, you, you, uh, yeah. So um, an image is going to come up on the screen and you'll have a second to scan it with your eyes and say what you saw. If it works. <laughs> no, it, it, it worked. <laughs> I know. I know you guys weren't there. <laughs> okay. I thought I saw what looked like an animal behind Mike Scribble. Like an animal in a field behind Scribble. Maybe a lion? A horse. No, a horse. A horse. A cat? Yeah. What do we see? Horse. Yep, it's a horse. So to me, the reason I did this was serpent seed to me is kind of like this. We know that's a horse, but there's some, it, there's some stuff in the way, but it's like obvious. It's like, that is a horse. Like, um, and so it's kind of like, there is no doubt of what the image is, but, and serpent seed is like that for me. It's like, this clicker is super it, fun. Yeah, a little delayed, maybe just not. But like, uh, you can just, it doesn't come out and say it, but you, you know it's there kind of thing. So that's the point of that. So just starting from the very, very, very basic, what is serpent seed? It's not an apple. It's a sexual act between Eve and the serpent. Very straightforward. Um, so I think we're gonna go into some scriptures. Something that I prioritized um, while making this was to include only scriptures. Um, you might notice there's no message quotes or commentaries from any other sources. And some of them were really good, but I left them out because I didn't want to muddy the waters for people who didn't know like who Brother Branham was. And, you know, but it's actually, you know, I feel like it's solid enough with just the Bible. So Amen. Amen. we're going to go into that. And I'm not the best reader. So if I skip words or mix things around, it's not because I'm trying to pull one over. It's just because I can't read. So <laughs> I'm going <laughs> to, yeah. Woo! <laughs> Golden Eagles, let's go. Okay, so um, here's some things that fruit represents in the Bible. I feel like offspring and general product is like very like highly emphasized, but also sex and sexual stuff, children, lineage offspring general like the product of something is the fruit of it um and we're going to go into some examples of that um genesis 1 verse 22 can everyone hear me okay and god blessed them saying be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters in the seas and let the fowl multiply in the earth so you'll see this term fruitful and multiply together very commonly 
um and it's kind of like you know multiply you know in a kind of in a literal sense and god blessed them and god said unto them be fruitful and multiply it and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over all the fish of the sea and so forth and god blessed noah and his sons and said unto them be fruitful and multiply it and replenish the earth so we all know that this is after the flood when there's no one left except their family presumably um and god says to be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth with people right right um as for ishmael i have heard thee behold i have blessed him and will make him fruitful and will multiply him exceedingly 12 princes shall he beget and i will make him a great nation so it uses the word fruitful, and then the example it gives is the 12 princes. So you can see that it was referring directly to people. Um, I know it's kind of monotonous with all the examples. I actually cut a bunch out, but there's so, so many where it's like, it just is over and over and over. So I just threw in a bunch. We'll go through them quickly just for the sake of making a point. And God Almighty bless thee and make thee fruitful and multiply that thou mayest be a multitude of people mm -hmm. pretty specific from fruitful to people yeah. um and god said unto him i am god almighty be fruitful and multiply a nation and a company of nations shall thou be or shall be of thee and kings shall come out of thy loins so we have another nation of kings you know um, and the children of Israel were fr fruitful and increased abundantly and multiplied and waxed exceeding mighty and the land was filled with them. Um, okay. Uh, here's a good one. And when Rachel saw that she bare Jacob no children, Rachel envied her sister and said unto Jacob, give me children or else I die pretty desperate i feel like and jacob's anger was kindled against rachel and he said am i in god's stead who hath withheld the from the fruit of the womb mm -hmm. so she wants children real bad mm -hmm. and uh he jacob is referring to the lack of children as withholding the fruit of her womb okay Okay, I think this is a prophecy, but I'm not sure. But, and he shall besiege thee in all thy gates until thy high and fence walls come down, wherein thou trusteth throughout all the land, and he shall besiege thee in all thy gates throughout all thy land, which the Lord thy God hath given thee. So I think it's talking about the nation of Israel, and they're saying you will be destroyed. And thou shalt eat the fruit of thine own body, the flesh of thy sons and daughters, which the Lord thy God hath given thee in the siege, and in the, uh, and in the straightness where, wherewith thine enemies shall distress thee. So I think it's, it's saying the fruit of thine own body is the flesh of thy sons and daughters. And I think that actually happened. Not like super keen on every like i don't remember but I, i'm pretty sure that happened where like they were actually eating their sons and daughters because it got like that bad but it calls them the fruit of their body yeah here's one from the new testament and it came to pass that when elizabeth heard the salutation of mary the babe leapt in her womb and elizabeth was filled with the holy ghost and she spake out with a loud voice and said Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb. Mm -hmm. Very popular serpent seed scripture, I feel like, in the message. Such is the way of an adulterous woman. She eateth and wipeth her mouth and saith, I have done no wickedness. Mm -hmm. um, so we know what an adulterous woman was, as we are proposing that Eve was. Yeah. Eateth and wipeth her mouth. Um, so it's a metaphor. Mm -hmm. It's kind of jumpy. Okay. Is there one between there? No. Okay. Okay. 
Here's Song of Solomon. Um, Awake, O north wind, and come thou south. Blow upon my garden, that the spices thereof may flow out. Let my beloved come into his garden and eat his pleasant fruits. Song of Solomon is a very romantic book. It's a, it's a very passionate. Mm -hmm. um, and he's speaking about his love, his wife. Um, and he's, he wants her to come into the garden. And so, transitioning to trees. Very oftentimes, trees are used to describe people in the Bible. Um, and I realized that while I was going over this today that I left out a really, like, major thing. But we'll talk about it in a little bit. But um, there's a ton of examples where trees are, are people. Um, here's another one from Song of Solomon. This, uh, this thy stature is like a palm tree, and thy breasts like clusters of grapes. I said, I will go up to the palm tree and take a hold of the boughs thereof. Now also thy breasts shall be as clusters of the vine, and the smell of thy nose like apples. So, again, Song of Solomon, he's talking about his wife, um, and he's calling her a tree, a palm tree. But there's some, there's some good ones coming up. So here's like a really, really good metaphor for trees being people. And I was actually really blown away when I first read this. I'm like, I did not know this was in the Bible. Um, Judges 9, verse 8 to 9. The trees went forth on a time to anoint a king over them. The trees went to anoint a king. <laughs> and they said unto the olive tree, reign thou over us. But the olive tree said unto them, should I leave my fatness wherewith by me they honor God and man and go and be promoted over the trees? So the olive tree said, nah. And the trees said unto the fig tree, come thou and reign over us. But the fig tree said unto them, should I forsake my sweetness and my good fruit and go be promoted over the trees? Then said the trees unto the vine, come thou and reign over us. And the vine said unto them, Should I leave my wine, which cheereth God and man, and go be promoted over the trees? Then said all the trees unto the bramble, Come thou and reign over us. And the bramble said unto the trees, If in truth ye anoint me king over you, then come and put your trust in my shadow. And if not, let fire come out of the bramble and devour the cedars of Lebanon. So it's like, that is a lot of trees talking. <laughs> like, so, I was like, w that's, that's crazy. I did not know that um, there's that much, but there's more. Behold, the Assyrian, speaking of a person, was a cedar in Lebanon with fair branches and with a shadowing shroud and of high stature, and his top was among the thick boughs. The waters made him great. The deep set him up on high with her rivers running round about his plants, and sent her little rivers unto all the trees of the field. Therefore his height was exalted above all the trees of the field, and his boughs were multiplied, and his branches became long because of the multitude of waters when he shot forth. All the fowls of the heaven made their nests in his boughs, and under his branches did all the beasts of the field bring forth their young, and under his shadow dwell all great nations." Thus was he fair in his greatness and in the length of his branches, for his root was by great waters. And then, this is really interesting. The cedars in the garden of God could not hide him. So what's the garden of God? Mm -hmm. Anyone know what the garden of God is? People can answer. Eden? Um, the fir trees were not like his boughs, and the chestnut trees were not like his branches, nor any tree in the garden of God, again, was like unto his beauty. I have made him fair by the multitude of his branches, so that all the trees of Eden that were in the garden of God envied him. So now it specifically names the garden of Eden. Yeah. And the trees envied this man. So it's interesting um, how trees would envy a man unless they were also some form of man. Um, so now we're going to go into the serpent. Very straightforward. He was not a snake before the curse. Um, he spoke to Eve and deceived her. I actually went and visited a friend in Colorado once, and they go to Colorado Christian University. And while I was there, uh, we 
I went to uh, her Old Testament class, and that day they were covering the fall. And uh, it was just really interesting. It's just a nominal Christian um, college. And the teacher was really adamant that this, the serpent was a snake the entire time and that he was, he, he never changed form or anything. He was just a talking snake. And he had all kinds of reasoning for that. And it's, it was really funny because I was just like, the whole time just like <laughs> asking all kinds of questions like but the other students uh had such thoughtful good things to say too um they brought up you know they're like well how is that it literally it says that he was cast to the ground like you know what was he before and um i don't know i was just highly impressed by the students and then another student was like so when Jesus says to the Pharisees that you are of your father, the devil, does that have anything to do with this? I'm like, <laughs> ah, and, and, the, and the teacher was like, oh, no, no, no. I was like, okay, well, that was a very insightful thought by that student. But it was just like the one class I went to <laughs> was the fall. And it was before I did all this. But I was like, you know, you kind of have a general understanding just from, but it was just really interesting. But we know this, the snake, he was not a snake before the curse, and we're going to go into that. And God said, Let the earth bring forth the living creature after his kind, cattle and creeping thing, and beast of the earth after his kind, and it was so. And God made the beast of the earth after his kind, and the cattle after their kind, and everything that creepeth on the earth after his kind. And God saw that it was good. The main thing I'm pulling from this is that we have three categories of animals. We have cattle, creeping things, and beasts of the field. It says it in this verse and this verse. Um, so it has those three separate things. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God hath made. I don't know. I just feel like if he was a snake the whole time, he would have been in the creeping things category. Yeah. Um, <laughs> does, that, does that make sense? Like, that's just... But he's... They go so out of their way to explain that there's three things, and they say it a few times, and then the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which God had made. I don't know. It's just something that caught my eye, so I thought I'd throw it in. Oh, yeah. For anyone who didn't know, this is really basic. I know we're all on the same page, but for anyone who doesn't, isn't sure that the serpent is the devil, um, I have this verse. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Need I say more? <laughs> it's like, just to remove any doubt. <laughs> and there's another one in Revelation that says basically the same thing, but I just included one for the sake of time. Um, so I think here we have a physical, the closest thing, or kind of the closest thing to a physical description of the serpent. Um, it is describing a man, um, but if you kind of have your spiritual thinking cap on, you can see that as it's talking about him, it's transitioning and it's like, okay, it's not talking about the guy anymore. It's almost talking about the spirit um, that was driving him. Um, so, son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus. So that's the, the dude that we're discussing. And say unto him, thus saith the Lord, thou sealest up the sum, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. That's kind of a high thing to say of a man, but they're, they're using this description for this king, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. And it's kind of like, oh, okay, interesting. But then it goes on. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Well, we know that that dude wasn't. It was, it's talking about the, what, what would you say, the underlying spirit of, of his reign. So, Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. And then it describes it. Every precious stone was thy covering. The sardius, topaz, and the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, and the carbuncle, and the gold. 
The workmanship of thy tabrets and thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou was created. So we have this very luxurious image of a man clothed in like gems. Um, and then it, it talks a little bit about some music stuff. Uh, the workmanship of thy tabrets and pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou was created. We know that Lucifer was very musical. Um, and a lot of, you know, music. He was the, what, what do they say, the song leader of heaven. Um, and it goes on. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so. Thou was upon the holy mountain, not any more, of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou was perfect in thy ways from the day thou was created, till iniquity was found in thee. Right? Yeah. Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason mm -hmm. of thy brightness. I will cast thee to the ground. I will lay thee before kings that they may behold thee. So it's describing this thing or man or being that was in the garden and then a physical description and then kind of briefly overviews like, you were way up here, but now you're cast to the ground. Mm -hmm. And it, it literally says, I will cast thee to the ground. So I think that's interesting. Um, so going back to, the, back to Genesis. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field, which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. But of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. So, I, I don't know, I feel like uh, something that jumps out in this after going over it a few times, and I feel like uh, I might have heard someone say this, so I might be stealing this, but... Uh, I don't think God ever told them not to touch it. I think his original um, command was to not eat of the fruit and to like, not partake of it. But when, e they, when the serpent asked Eve about it, she said, you shall not eat it, neither shall you touch it. So she added in that little detail that wasn't included. But somehow in her mind, um, that was like inferred. So like, you don't eat it you don't touch it, like, you just stay away from it fully. Um, even though God never actually said that, she kind of gleaned that little bit of information just by her context of knowing what it was. Mm -hmm. Being, like, t touch being, like, such a big deal. Um, and the serpent said unto the woman, ye shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also to her husband with her, and he did eat. So we have the sin going on. Um, I've actually had someone from my high school, it wasn't from the group that I presented this to, um, use this verse against serpent seed because they're like, well, it says her husband was with her. So are you saying like they literally just did that in front of Adam? And I was like, interesting point. I'm going to go look that up because I, I was like, I don't know. Like, I don't know what to say. And I think he said standing with her and the Bible just says with her. But um, it's kind of like one of those two-dimensional pictures like you know the books but if you like look at it the right way it like pops out does anyone know what i'm talking about um they're like the 3d like fun things like um they're kind of yeah i think my grandparents have one of those but that's what this was for me it was just like i was looking at and it and then all of a sudden this thing like came forward and i was like i can't unsee it now <laughs> And I'm like, okay, the very thing that you were trying to use against this, I feel like is a point for it, so let's go. Um, she took of the fruit therefore or thereof and did eat, comma, and she gave also to her husband with her, and he did eat. 
So if the fruit is what we are proposing, it is not the type of fruit that you can partake of by yourself. Mm -hmm. You need to partake of it with someone. Mm -hmm. And so when I saw this, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat and then gave unto her husband with her mm -hmm. and he did eat. And once I saw that, I was like, <coughs> whoa, that, that really, I don't know. I just, I saw it in a totally different way because he was trying to use it as an argument and I'm like, little do you know. But it gets, it gets even better. I feel like the nail in the coffin on this argument um, too was there's a scripture, I think it's in Jude, that straight up says Adam was not deceived. Right. But Eve was deceived. So I'm like, I could turn that around and say, so you're saying Adam was literally standing there, not deceived, and said nothing? He wasn't there. He was, he was totally in a different place. It was later that she brought the fruit to him and they partook together. See what I'm saying? Yep. And the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. Pretty straightforward. It's like to non-message believers, um, you know, this is like the first time they're seeing this, but we all know, like, why would the apple make them know that they're naked? You know, and they instantly sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. I underlined aprons, though, because the... The way we think of aprons in our day is like uh, something like a cook wears or um, to keep your clothes clean. But in this context, and I, I looked into like the underlying word and everything, this word aprons, it means clothing that covers the sexual areas of your body. And so they, that's what they covered when they, when they made themselves the fig leaves. So it's just another little extra detail that's like, I don't know, just makes you think. And the Lord God said unto the woman, What is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. So this, this word beguiled, it's like tricked or deceived or fooled. But I looked at a few other places in the Old Testament where it's used, and it's very often used with kind of a sexual connotation. Um, and so the other example that I just remember off the top of my head was the um, Jacob marrying Leah when he wanted to marry Rachel. And so he was drunk at his wedding. And then when he woke up the next morning, he realized that he had been beguiled because he had married Leah instead of Rachel. And so that's another place where it uses the word, but it's kind of like tricked with like a sexual undertone. Not always, but it, ha it is used that way. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and thus shalt thou eat all the, the days of thy life. So I don't know how you could see this and think that he was already a snake. Um, to me, it just seems like because you have done this, Upon thy belly shalt thou go. It, it wouldn't, what punishment would it be if he was already right. on his belly, if he was already a snake? Yeah. It's clearly the punishment for the crime. And that is what he says. Because you have done this, this is what's going to happen. But it'd kind of be like big deal if he was already doing it. So, mm -hmm. um, mm hmm. Mm -hmm. it again, like, yeah. Out of all the beasts of the field, mm -hmm. the first, yeah. And, and, and lower down. Right. Lower down below that. Category, yeah. Like mm -hmm. earlier, you like, were here. Now you're here. Yeah. yeah. So. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed, and it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. It's really interesting giving this to message believers because I feel like. I'm saying things and sounding like a broken record because you all know all this. Like, um, but we have the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent. This is God speaking to the serpent, by the way. Mm -hmm. 
God speaking, I will put enmity between thee, the serpent, and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. And uh, I've heard people say, people are like, this is why people don't like snakes, because um, God put enmity between the seeds of the families, and now people don't like snakes. I'm like, that's great, but that is that is not correct. Um, <laughs> but it's just, it's funny. Um, but we clearly have, like, the woman's seed and the serpent's seed mentioned, um, and that they will be at enmity between each other. Okay. And the wo or unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception, and in sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. So this is where God's kind of dealing the punishments to the, the people. Um, so he says, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. And I don't know, I feel like when I get this, it's, it's kind of subtle, but I see he's kind of acknowledging that she's already conceived. It's like thy conception. It's not like in when you conceive. It's like thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, plural, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. So another classic message thing that we all know, but just for the sake of the study, um, why would her punishment be the pain in childbirth and sorrow in conception um, if it was an apple? Right? It's like the the punishment perfectly aligns with the crime. Yeah. Yeah. Uh huh. Uh huh. Uh huh. Yeah. No, it just fits perfectly with, you know. And then um, I don't think I have it in this PowerPoint, but um, the punishment to Adam was that he would have to work and provide for a family. So it's like now you are given the responsibility of your decision and having children, you will have to find a way to provide for them. So you'll have to work by the sweat of your brow and create a some sort of income or a way to live. Um, and that was like his side of the punishment. Also family related though, even though, you know. And Adam chooses this moment to be like, I have an idea. We've called you woman this whole time. We're going to change your name. So, and Adam called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. Up to this point, she was just called the woman or woman. Um, and now, suddenly, Adam's like, your name is now Eve, and it happens to mean mother of all living. I just feel like it's just too suspicious timing. Like, um... And if you didn't, if you didn't believe that she'd already conceived, then it was just I don't know. I just feel like it just works so perfectly together. Yes. Um, and why isn't Adam called the father of all living? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that is another good point. Adam's yeah. never called the father of all living. Yeah. Interesting. And Adam knew his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain, and said, "I have gotten a man from the Lord." And again, or and she again bare his brother Abel, and Abel was a keeper of the sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. This scripture has been, I feel like, a thorn in the flesh of many a message believer who's trying to believe serpent seed. But they're like, it literally says, and Adam knew his or knew or Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain. It's like, well, and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. Um, so we know that all life comes from God. Um, but then right after that, and she again bare his brother Abel. And Abel was a keeper of the sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. Now when I gave this presentation to my friends, I said, just hold this in your mind. Because I'm, I'm, uh, the things that are coming up next will make this a lot clearer. But we have Adam knowing his wife once, and then two children coming forth. So we're, we're going to, it's kind of a murky window right now, but we're going to clear it up, clean it up a little bit, and uh, it'll make sense. So I just told everyone to just kind of like 
think about it, but just hold it and we'll get to it. And Adam knew his wife again, and she bare a son, and called his name Seth. For God said, She hath appointed me another seed instead of Abel, who Cain slew. So, why would you need another seed if you got Cain? But he was not the son of Adam, so they needed another seed instead of Abel. And we're, gonna, we're about to dive into it, but the Bible goes so out of the way to explain that Seth is instead of Abel because they needed another one or um, because Abel was dead or Cain slew him, but they never are like, and Cain is disqualified because he killed him. But that's not really how it works. You know, it's like if you're the firstborn, you are the, the, the firstborn. Yeah, it's not something you earn. It's something you are. And so if Cain was truly the firstborn, he would carry the lineage on, whether he like deserved it or not. Um, that's just how it worked. Um, but he's never mentioned as a son of Adam at all. And Adam lived 130 years and begat a son in his own likeness and after his image and called his name Seth. So they really want you to know Seth is in the likeness of Adam in his own image, in his own likeness. Yes. They kind of go out of their way to express that. Um, it's like, unlike Cain. Um, and Cain talked with Abel, his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and slew him. And the Lord said unto Cain, Where is Abel thy brother? And he said, I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? And he said, What hast thou done? The voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. So, we got a murderer and a liar. So we got the first murder in history and presumably the first lie or the first recorded. Um, or except for the serpent himself lying to Eve. But it's like, yeah, well, you know. It's just, it was in his blood to lie, you know? And so he's a, a murderer, and then he's a liar. So I have the genealogy of Adam for you. We got Adam, Seth, Enos, Canaan, Ham, Jared, Enoch, Methuselah, Lamech, and Noah. And... <laughs> um, no Cain. And he's not even mentioned. Like, it's not like, and Seth took the place of Cain because he was a murderer. It was just like, he's just dead stock not mentioned. He's not there. Um, but Cain has his own genealogy. His own genealogy. Like, and then it talks about Cain. And Cain knew his wife, and she conceived and bare Enoch. Not the same Enoch, different one. Popular name or something. And unto Enoch was born Erad, and Erad, him, and him, and him, and him. And he begat Lamech. And you can see, as you're reading this, I didn't make the slide very good. I don't know what I was doing. But the point of it is we got Cain's own genealogy, and the people are getting more and more evil as time goes down. So this Lamech guy um, was a terrible murderer. And, he, and it, it even says, if Cain shall be avenged, avenged sevenfold, truly Lamech, seventy and sevenfold. So he was a descendant of Cain, and he was way worse. He was just a terrible murderer, um, so much worse than Cain. And you can see that as that line is going down, it's just evil being spread. Um, so here's the order of things, and this is rich. So Cain murders Abel, and it immediately launches into Cain's genealogy. Um, then after that, Adam knew his wife again, and she bare a son and called his name Seth. For God said, she hath appointed me another seed instead of Abel whom Cain slew. Um, and then we go a little bit down um, Adam's genealogy, just a tiny bit. And then to Seth, to him also there was born a son and called his name Enos. Then began men to call upon the name of the Lord. So we got one line getting more and more evil right. and one line 
st beginning to call on the name of the Lord. Amen. Um, after that, we got the genealogy of Adam, which I listed. Mm -hmm. And then, and Adam lived 130 years and begat a son in his own likeness and after his image and called his name Seth. And that is the chronological order that it is in the Bible. But it just goes so out of the way to demonstrate that there's two different families mm -hmm. and that Seth was needed to continue the line of Adam because Cain has his own family and he's his own thing. Like if uh, Adam was Cain's father, when they're doing the genealogy, you could have just thrown Adam in there just because he was the dad, yeah. but they didn't. Right. You know, it would have been so simple to just be like, Cain, the son of uh, Adam, but it was just started with him and went down. And then you got another genealogy for um, Adam. Uh, and then this is a little bit later. And it came to pass, when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and, the, or, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw that the daughters of men, that they were fair, and, that, and they took them wives of which they chose. And there were giants in the earth in those days. And also after that, when the sons of God came, in, came unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men, which were of old men of renown. That was rough, but it's okay. Um, so we got two families. We got the sons of God right. and the daughters of men. Mm -hmm. I know there's like ideas out there about like angels coming down and yeah, taking human angels. form and but they call those the sons of God how could mm -hmm. the, how could fallen angels be the sons of God right that, so that doesn't make any yeah sense. I have heard the the angel thing where it's like angels take human form and then they mix with the humans and it's the whole thing the book of Enoch mm. Well, what I get out of this is that there's two families. We've got sons of God, daughters of men, and then they mix yes. as the generations go down. Then immediately we got giants out of nowhere um, in those days. And I feel like, I don't know, this might be going out on a limb here, but like when you hybrid like species of things, mm -hmm. like sometimes like a lot of what you some like a common thing is abnormal size yeah. like big or small so like they hybrid all our food to make it bigger right. and more productive and uh you know to change it but suddenly we got giants and i don't know where they came from but it's right after the sons of god and the daughters of men mixed so it's just a thought i don't know if it's anything but it just seems weird to me these are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations, and Noah walked with God. And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. So we got Noah, this perfect man. Actually, it doesn't say his, he was perfect, but he said it was perfect in his generations. Mm -hmm. Like his lineage was perfect. Mm -hmm. Like un like on uh yeah yeah not mingled it was just it was perfect in his generations and then right after that god looked upon the earth and behold it was corrupt for all flesh mm -hmm. had corrupted his way on the earth so it's not like they were doing really bad things or it was like their flesh their very bodies were had become corrupted mm -hmm. through the generations um and of course, it was a sinful time, and God wanted to start, you know, have the flood and wipe that out. But it just, it's interesting. It says their flesh was corrupted. Mm -hmm. um, jumping way into the New Testament. Wherefore, and I think this is John the Baptist speaking. Someone fact check that. I don't know. Wherefore, ye be witnesses unto yourselves that ye are the children of them which killed the prophets. Maybe it's Jesus. I think it's actually Jesus. I just don't have it in red. My bad. Ye are the children of them which killed the prophets. Fill ye up then the measure of your fathers, ye serpents, ye generation of vipers. How can ye escape the damnation of hell? 
So we got, uh, you killed the prophets because you are a generation of vipers. Mm -hmm. Like, it's not like you're a snake. It's like you are a generation of, you know, it's just the choice of words are just so, yeah. so Your good. I know. Mm hmm exactly. Mm -hmm. This is so good. <laughs> it's like, um, <laughs> it's like, it's one of those things where it's like, you, this, I feel like, establishes for me that the Pharisees were well aware of this doctrine, and they believed it. Um, so much that Jesus didn't even have to really say it fully, and they already knew what he was saying. And you can tell in this, so he, Jesus speaking to the Pharisees, I speak that which I've seen my, with my father, and ye do that which ye have seen with your father. So he's like, I do what my father does, and you do what your father does. And they answered and said, um, Abraham is our father. So they're talking literal lineage, right? Abraham, the literal father of nations. But they're already kind of like, what are you trying to say here? Abraham's our father, you know? Uh, and Jesus says, if you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. Mm -hmm. And... But now you seek to kill me, a man that has told you the truth, which have, wait, which I have heard of God. This did not Abraham. So it's like, you're trying to kill me because I am speaking truth and you're not liking it. And Abraham didn't do that. And then he says, ye do the deeds of your father. Then they said unto him, we be not born of fornication, for we have one father, even God. So this is a two-fold thing. Um, he's saying, you're trying to kill me because I'm telling the truth. And they obviously know who killed someone who is doing the truth. And so they say, we are not born of fornication. We have one father, even God. And they're going back like Seth, um, Adam, God, like mm -hmm. back up that line. But another thing is we all as message believers and as Christians, um, believe in the virgin birth of Jesus, Amen. but they didn't. They thought he was just like, they're this, have this whole thing. And, um, and so they're kind of like, we weren't born of fornication, but like you were like, so it's kind of like a double, you know? Mm -hmm. So they're like, how can you call us serpent seed when you're born of fornication? <laughs> like, cause they didn't believe the virgin birth at all. They thought it was totally like nonsense, but Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So he hasn't even said it yet, and they already are like, whoa. Man. Like, yeah, they're already upset at that. And then he's like, let me make myself clear. <laughs> ye are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the yes. beginning. And abode not in truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. Yes. So we got, you know, they're kind of like, I feel like they're kind of like beating around the bush here. Like mm -hmm. Jesus is like kind of saying stuff and they're kind of like, mm, I don't know, like you're kind of on very thin ice right now. And then he's like, okay, I'm just going to say it. <laughs> like <laughs> you are of your father, the devil. He was a murderer from the beginning, yeah. and uh, also says he is the father of lies. Mm -hmm. So, pretty clear. Um, I think this is John the Baptist. Yes. I said that last time, but I really think it's <laughs> this time. <laughs> then said he unto the multitude that came forth to be baptized of him, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bring forth, therefore, fruits worthy of repentance. So he's calling them generation of vipers. And then he's like, And do not say within yourselves, We have Abraham our father. For I say unto you, That God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. And now also the axe is laid unto the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, therefore which bringeth not forth good fruit, is hewn down and cast into the fire. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. And so he's like, he calls them a generation of vipers and he already knows what they're thinking. So he's like, 
don't try and say Abraham's your father because you know the truth. Um, so yeah. This is what, uh, later in the New Testament, we got uh, Paul speaking, and he's using a, a metaphor here. For I am jealous over you with a godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. So he's using the analogy. He wants the church to be pure yeah. from the world, and he uses the metaphor of a virgin to Christ. But then he says, But... I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtility, so your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. So he's like, I want you to be virgins to Christ, unlike what ser the serpent did to Eve, basically. So it's just a one-to-one, -one straight over... A Oh yeah, this one was the nail in the coffin for me. When I heard this scripture, I was like, like you're done. Like, I was like, hey, I'm like, I can't believe this is in the Bible because I heard Brother Branham say it and I was like, that's not in the Bible. It, like, it couldn't be that clear, could it? But then I read it and it is. For this is the message um, that ye heard from the beginning that we should love one another. Not as Cain, who was of that wicked one and slew his brother, and wherefore, or, and wherefore slew he him? Because his own works were evil and his brothers were righteous. righteous. Yeah, but I heard um, Brother Branham say, it's like, yeah, like, and Cain, it says he was of the wicked one. When I'm like, no, it doesn't. Like, it couldn't, like, how could it be that obvious? Like, but it does. And I have of in color because I took the time to go into the underlying Greek word it's been a year since I did the study, so I can't remember what it was. But it's the same of as the genealogies in Matthew, where it's like this guy of this guy of this guy, speaking of a literal lineage. Mm -hmm. So we got Cain, who was of the wicked one. And I think that's Good. the last slide. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I gave this presentation to my friends and it went over so good um, there were four people that really cared about it and they were just like and I, <laughs> I made a big fruit salad for all of them and I was like anyone want fruit <laughs> we're gonna get into it it was really fun and um, we got into some other areas of it that I didn't have in here so um, the two things like that I feel like I really like didn't include that I could have was the fact that Jesus was virgin born mm -hmm. and kind of going into that and that like unfolded with discussion like people had questions it was cool though because like we we're talking for a while and people were asking questions but after a while they kind of started answering their own questions I didn't even have to say anything like someone would ask a question they're like oh remember it's this like and it was a really, really cool experience to see. And I could see that they were getting it, too. Like, um, one of the guys was like, because uh, at the end, I was kind of like, so now we're going to go back to the snake talking to Eve, trying to convince her to take a bite of a fruit that would do all this. Now tell me who's crazy. Like... <laughs> <laughs> like, and this one guy was like, <laughs> it, 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 I could just tell it just like exploded his brain. He was just like, whoa, like, I'm like, which one makes more sense? Like, right. you know, um, so you think like, you think this is weird? Like, take a look at what you think. Like, <laughs> like how weird is that? But, um, the two things were, we talked about Jesus being virgin born. And then the other one was Jesus being the tree of life. So if you go into the kind of the Jesus side of it, which I, I didn't as much, but if we believe that the tree of good and evil was a, a man, then you can rightly assume that the tree of life would be a man too, or a, a being or, a, you know, a figure. Yeah. Um, and we know that it is Jesus and he's, and I think it, it mentions it in Revelation, the tree of life. Yes. Um, I think actually the tree of life is mentioned six times in the Bible three in Genesis and three in Revelation or something like that. Or it's like, it's symmetrical. Um, 
but we, yeah, so that's, that's, yeah. Any thoughts?